going to be talking about lighting during a power outage. And we don't have the hands up for it yet, but we'll also be talking about staying warm during a power outage. Good. Uh, so first of all, I'm just going to play a quick video. This will bring it back. It, it was seems good. Picture this. It's a serene evening. You're at home, the lights are on, everything seems normal. But then, without warning, the power grid goes dark. Suddenly, the familiar hum of electricity is replaced by an unsettling quiet. The lights are out, the TV is off, and your phone, your primary connection to the world, okay. is quickly losing battery. A shiver of uncertainty runs down your spine. What now? Welcome to the unseen threat, the possibility of a power grid failure. It's not a far-fetched scenario. In fact, the power grid we rely on every day is a complex, interconnected system, and like any system, it has its vulnerabilities. From weather-related events like hurricanes, early waves, and solar storms, to human power disruptions like cyber attacks or even simple human error, the power grid can go down without much warning. And when it does, it can take days, weeks, or even longer to fully restore. Now, let's be clear. This isn't about fear. It's about awareness. It's about understanding the risks and the realities of our modern world. And most importantly, it's about being prepared. Because the truth is, when the power grid fails, it's not just about losing the ability to switch on a light or charge your phone. It's about losing a lifeline. In a world without power, the basics become critical. Food, water, warmth, and communication become your top priorities. And the more prepared you are, the better you can navigate through the darkness and uncertainty. So what can we do to stay ahead of the curve? The answer is simple. We prepare. We learn. We adapt. We understand the potential threats and plan accordingly. We gather the tools and knowledge necessary to survive and thrive in a world without power. And in doing so, we illuminate our own path to readiness. And that's what this series is all about. Over the next few scenes, we're going to explore the must-have items for power grid failure, the importance of communication, how to keep your devices powered up, and how to secure your supplies. So, are you ready? Let's illuminate the path to readiness. Now that the lights are out, we're going to talk about the must-have items to illuminate the darkness and keep you prepared. First up, portable lighting. Imagine the darkness that descends when the power grid fails. It's not just about not being able to see. It's about the unease that comes with the uncertainty. That's where portable lighting steps in. Flashlights, lanterns, headlamps, these are your first line of defense against the dark. They're like your guiding stars, cutting through the blackness and helping you navigate your surroundings. Flashlights are compact, easy to use, and powerful. They can light up a room, a path, or even a face in the dark. Lanterns, on the other hand, are ideal for lighting up larger spaces. They provide 360-degree light, perfect for when you're huddled together with your family, discussing the way forward. Headlamps free up your hands, allowing you to work or move while still having a light source. But remember, these sources of light are only as good as their power source. Batteries, rechargeable, or one-time use are essential. Store them in a cool, dry place and check their expiry dates. Solar-powered lights are also a great option. They harness the power of the sun during the day and light up your nights. As we illuminate our surroundings, let's not forget about the falling temperatures. When the power goes out, so does the heat. As the temperature drops, staying warm becomes crucial. Blankets and insulation are more than comfort. They're a lifeline in the cold and dark. Blankets, sleeping bags, and warm clothing can make a world of difference. Insulating your home with plastic sheeting on windows and using draft stoppers can also help retain heat. And in extreme cold, remember that body heat is a valuable resource. Huddling together under blankets can keep the cold at bay. So there you have it. Portable lighting to pierce the darkness and blankets and insulation to combat the cold. These are the first steps in navigating a power grid failure. But we're just getting started. Stay tuned as we delve deeper into the other must-have items in the next scene. In the silence that follows a power grid failure, communication becomes paramount. Let's pause for a moment and consider this. The usual hum of daily life is abruptly replaced by an unsettling quiet. The lights are out, the TV is silent, and your cell phone signal, non-existent. You're plunged into a world where the usual channels of communication are cut off. This is where the importance of a two-way radio comes to the fore. Two-way radios, or walkie-talkies as they're commonly known, are an invaluable tool in a crisis situation. 
They're affordable, easy to use, and most importantly, they don't rely on an external power source or network to operate. In essence, they're a lifeline in the darkness, a means to reach out when all other lines of communication are down. Consider this scenario. You're in your home, navigating the darkness, and you need to know if your neighbors are okay, or if they need help, or perhaps you need assistance yourself. With a two-way radio in your hand, you can send out a call for help or offer assistance to those in need. It's a beacon in the dark, a voice amidst the silence. But two-way radios are more than just a means of communication. They're a tool for building a network of support. They allow you to stay connected with your community, sharing updates and pooling resources. They transform isolated pockets of people navigating the darkness into a connected, supportive network. Think about it. In a world where the power grid has failed, where the usual hum of daily life has been replaced by silence, your neighbors aren't just people living next door. They're your allies, your support network, and two-way radios are the key to forging these vital connections. So while we hope that we never have to face a situation as dire as a power grid failure, it pays to be prepared. And a two-way radio should be a vital part of your preparedness plan. Two-way radios not only bridge the gap, but also create a network of support. Imagine a world where neighbors become allies, helping each other navigate the challenges that unfold. Power outages don't have to mean complete darkness. Portable generators and solar chargers are your allies in keeping essential devices powered up. Now let's delve into the world of portable power. Picture this, the lights go out, your phone is dying, and communication is vital, but you planned ahead. You pull out your portable generator and suddenly, darkness gives way to light. Your phone springs back to light and you're connected to the world again. Portable generators are a lifeline in the blackout. They can power essential appliances, charge devices, and light up your home, creating an oasis of normalcy in an otherwise darkened world. But what fuels these generators? Most run on gasoline, diesel, or propane. It's essential to have a good supply of fuel stored safely away. But remember, fuel doesn't last forever, so rotate your stock, keep it fresh, and your generator will be ready when you need it. Now let's talk about solar chargers. These little powerhouses harness the energy of the sun to charge your devices. It's as simple as placing the charger in direct sunlight, connecting your device, and letting Mother Nature do the rest. Solar chargers are lightweight, portable, and require no additional fuel, making them an excellent addition to any preparedness kit. But what if it's been raining for days and the sun is nowhere to be seen? That's where portable battery banks come into play. Charged up and ready to go, these banks can hold enough power to keep your devices running for days. And when paired with a solar charger, you've got an endless cycle of power. Solar power charges battery banks, so you can use power to use any time you would like. Generators require gas to operate, but will also provide you with power as long as you have gas to rebuild the generator. So fellow preppers, remember when the lights go out, you don't have to be left in the dark. With a little planning and the right equipment, you'll be powered up and ready for anything. In the midst of uncertainty, securing supplies becomes crucial. Picture the scenario again. The power grid has failed and you are plunged into darkness. But this is not a time for panic. Instead, it's a time for action, for tapping into your preparedness mindset and utilizing the supplies you've diligently gathered. Food and water, two fundamental necessities of life, are at the top of our list. In a world without electricity, grocery stores and restaurants cease to function, and tap water may not be safe to consume. This is where your emergency food and water supplies come into play. These supplies aren't your everyday pantry items. They're specially selected for their long shelf life and easy storage. Canned goods, for instance, can last for years without refrigeration. They're also diverse, providing a range of nutrients to keep you healthy. From canned vegetables and fruits to meats and soups, these are items that will keep you nourished in a crisis. Stored water is another must have. The rule of thumb is to store at least one gallon of water per person per day for a minimum of three days. But the more, the better. Water isn't just for drinking, it's also for cooking, cleaning, and sanitation. And let's not forget about freeze-dried food. These meals are lightweight, compact, and can last up to 25 years unopened. All it takes is some boiling water, and you have a hot meal ready to eat. But how do you manage all these supplies? That's where your prepper pantry steps in. A well-organized pantry allows you to rotate your supplies so nothing goes to waste. It's also a visual reminder of what you have and what you may need to restock. Emergency food and water are your lifelines. They transform a challenging situation into a manageable one. The prepper pantry comes in clutch here with all of your foods you have been storing. When the power is out, you will have options from your canned goods section, stored water, and even your freeze-dried food will keep you eating in a crisis. 
And there you have it, fellow preppers. We've journeyed through a world plunged into darkness, navigated the quiet streets, and wrestled with the cold. We've shown a light on the must-have items for such a scenario. Portable lighting, blankets, two-way radios, generators, and emergency food and water. But let's not forget, it's not just about the tangible items. It's about adopting a preparedness mindset. It's about the willingness to prepare for the unexpected, the readiness to face challenges head on, and the resilience to adapt and overcome. It's about seeing your neighbors as allies and understanding that in times of crisis, we're stronger together. We've illuminated the path to readiness. Now, the power is in your hands. Equip yourself with not just the physical tools, but also the mental fortitude required. Prepare today and thrive tomorrow. With that said, thanks for joining me, and I will see you on the next one. Take care. Um, well, a couple things I want to say about that video is he, had, he talked about the power pack and he showed this little power pack in his cell phone. Well, there's power packs or battery packs uh, that come in all different sizes. I mean, you can get a battery pack that uh, can run your whole house um, <coughs> with solar panels. So they come in all sizes. He just kind of had a little one there, which he should have really shown that you can get in all sizes that can uh, power a multitude of things. Also, <laughs> something I wanted to say too, um, they talked about the pantry and knowing what's in your pantry and having your pantry well stocked. But he also, he just mentioned food on that part of it. But it's a good thing to have your preparedness items in a place that if an emergency happens, you can access those things that you need immediately or in the next day or so, and you know where they're at instead of searching through your house like, where did I put the lanterns? Or where did I put the power pack? Where did I put the oil for the lantern? You know, um, have maybe a tote, depending upon uh, how much prepared, how many preparedness items you have like this, you know, a, a large Christmas tote might work. Or if you have a lot of bigger items, like maybe have um, a big lantern or the buddy heaters. Um, they do sell those big storage unit things um, at like Walmart or Costco, Sam's Club, and they're fairly cheap actually, but it's pretty much just a big tote with a lid on it, and you can store a lot of stuff in there. But to have at least the majority of your um, necessities stored in one place, so you're not searching all over when you need them. Um, so just a couple of suggestions that he didn't talk about. So, uh, First thing I just want to talk about quick on solar lights. Solar lights, even the stuff that you put out, the ones that you put outside on your walkway, they work great for in the house. Um, charge them up during the day and you just put them around the house in different places, one in the bathroom, one in the bedroom, one in the living room, um, and they can last for hours, you know, for the evening and keep your house lit. Um, another thing is oil lamps and you know, you all know what all these things are, and I'm not showing you anything you haven't seen already, but maybe some of these things you haven't thought about using as a preparedness item, or maybe you think something like this is really outdated, why would anybody want that? Well, it's a, it's a pretty cheap way to make light, and um, this is what they used, you know, hundred and some years ago for light. And when that went out, they went to bed. You know, they went to bed early. They didn't it up until midnight, one o'clock in the morning with their oil lamp burning. You know, they were in bed by nine o'clock at night, so they weren't using up all their um, supplies that they had. But uh, a lamp like this can provide a lot of light. I mean, this would light this room, not like these lights do, but we'd be able to see everybody. Um, something like this you can still buy. We got these on Facebook Marketplace, and I think Bob picked them up for like $30 for two of them. Our Craigslist, one of the two, but thirty yeah, bucks for two. Yeah, a piece. So fairly cheap, and we just keep them stored away. I, I, it's actually um, on one of our bookshelves. It's, it's accessible, but um, it's not somewhere where it's going to get Plus you bought them from where? So, but if you buy something like that, you want to make sure that you have something to power it with. So, you know, a couple of uh, jugs of 
oil. And what I'm going to show you is the same thing you see here, but you can see where you can purchase it and how much, how many pounds. It's the exact same thing I have here. Um, $24.95, it seems like a lot. It is, that's a lot of money, but should you ever need it, you know, you're going to wish you that you had spent the $25. What is the fair thing like smoke this? <laughs> this is a clean burning fuel, yeah. I mean, you can use other things. You can actually use uh, vegetable oil in lamps, um, which is okay. Uh, you can use different things, but this is like a, a pretty clean burning fuel that you don't have to worry about smoking up the place or, you know, uh, breathing a bunch of bad chemicals. But then you also want to make sure you have... How long will that jug last? Well, it depends on how long you stay up at night. Yeah, but <laughs> How many hours will that You know, I I have not tested it, and I, it doesn't say on here. I'm not really sure how one jug. We bought, I think, two jugs. Of this. But like I said, you run out of this that vegetable oil store, you can use vegetable oil. Can you use kerosene? You can use kerosene. Kerosene is going to smoke, and it's going to smell. You know, so this is probably a preferred way, especially if you have children, you know, you don't want them to breathe on it. If you use anything but clean burning fuel like this, and even using a clean burning fuel like this, you might just want to open up a couple windows like an inch, get some cross ventilation. Um, is always safe. Uh, always better to be safe than sorry. Uh, Buy a wick. This was, I think, thirty feet. Let's see where it says on the I think this was thirty feet. This will last a long time. But they come in different sizes. So if you do buy an oil lamp, make sure you know the correct wick width to buy, so it burns properly. Otherwise, it's going to burn up fast, or it's just not going to burn right. So uh, we have a small lamp at home that I bought the smaller with for, and then this one I think was a three quarter inch. Um, but so you can get them on Amazon too. And it's not super cheap, but they're not real expensive. It's good to have them. Buy a big bulk one like that. They do come in like short <coughs> strips, like what's in this wick or what's in this lamp already. But I found it a lot more cost efficient to buy a roll like that and just cut it as uh, big as you want it. <coughs> so oil lamps provide fresh, provide fresh air while using a regular oil lamp. Can use cooking oil in an oil lamp using cook cooking oil does not need ventilation. Olive oil works the best as it does not give off any odor. However, using cook cooking oil does not burn efficiently and the wick will burn away more quickly. <coughs> Um, so then I have a uh, link for the oil if you wanted to purchase that. But, you know, if you wanted some things, you just don't make them, but you can get them cheaper and just on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, uh, places like that. Mm -hmm. Flashlights, we all know what a flashlight is, um, but, you know, have batteries for the flashlights you have. They, they make different kinds of flashlights. Uh, this is more of like a lantern flashlight, which I'm sure you've all seen before, but it's, it's pretty bright. And something like this versus a regular flashlight that just, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like what Rick had where you can point it at somebody. Um, it's a, that kind of flashlight is directional. So your light is going to go in one direction. This, however, works just like a regular light does and the light's going to disperse in all directions. So it's something that um, would work better for in a room where you just wanted to have regular lighting in it. These also have different. Yeah, and you can turn, 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 <coughs> tune it so it's bright or not. But you know, something like this that you can just like leave in the bathroom. Somebody's going to go walk in to use the bathroom. They just flick the switch. They don't have to carry a flashlight and turn it on. You know, or in any room. But these work really well for you know that type of thing. 
you have a power source no matter what, pretty much. Um, it also is a crank, so you can um, charge it by cranking it. You know, so it actually has four sources of power. So we keep one of these in our, each one of us in our kit home bags. And you can figure it
lighting, I guess, <coughs> item, um, just because it's cl the closest to what we're used to, instead of having a flame or you know flashlight. This is uh, pretty close to just having regular light bulbs, but doesn't really take anything other than solar power to. Or yeah. Or as we're making your battery boxes. Needs to be able to power to it, yeah. <laughs> that other connection on there is for charging it up from the USB source. The USB would be the Okay, so that would that would be the USB source. Yeah, yeah. So charging this up <coughs> from a USB source, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this could be charged up by what? A USB source.
person. Without a nightlight on or you know, some other kind of light shining underneath their door or whatever. Something like this is something that can calm them or soothe them. So just to have, you know, if you have children, young children or grandchildren, to have these in your emergency kit just for them. It just it helps to calm them a little bit. Just to have that light that they can hold. You should have <laughs> 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 Oh, here was, the, here was the uh, replacement. This is not the one that I have. It's just one that I pulled up for today. But $8, that's 20% off today. Um, for 13 feet, and there's two rolls. That's a pretty good price. <laughs> Does that information answer your question on the power out or the power on it? I think some said six watts. Hmm? It said it was a six watt thing. Yeah, if you scroll down a ways, somewhere it says six watts. Up to six watts. There's a, yep. There's an upgrade. Six watts in direct sunlight. Yeah. But still, I think we're having, and we also, both Bob and I have one of these in our get home bags, just in case we need lighting, or if the cell towers are still up and running, if something happens, then we can charge our cell phones or whatever it is that we need to charge up. <laughs>
So he's got a couple holes punched into the top of the lid for airflow. And he's got a cut wick inside that he actually made himself with, with cotton, but you can certainly use uh, something like that that we probably have here. And he has used oil in the bottom. I'm sure it's kind of used cooking oil, but I'm not positive. But even something like that, you know, if you don't want to buy this, you know, you can make some yourself. Which I thought was a pretty <coughs> good idea. Pretty simple. Okay, so that's it for the lights. Could you utilize used cooking oil? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can use it. It's gonna, it's going to um, have particles in it that will probably make your wick burn very unevenly. Right. But you can, you know, and if you use that in some kind of, well, you would want to use this, but. It, it's probably going to gum things up a little bit more than if it was clean. But yeah, anything like that would will work. It's just going to be a more dirty burning. You know? Well, the worst effect is you're going to filter out any chunks. You know, those chemicals. But I think the wick would probably burn faster than too because yeah. of that. But your your chunks, like your bacon bits or something, it's not going to go up through the wick. So it's going to be like. Um, uh, <laughs> Yes. Have you uh, been aware of, it's called a Lucy light, L-U-C-I, Lucy light? I have heard of it, but I... It's an LED light. It's about the size of a bottom part of a uh, two-quart pop model, about that size. But it's collapsible. It's LED. It's got a built-in uh, solar panel on top of it. And then it'll run about 20 hours. We use those camping and then hang it up and it runs all night. The ones we, that fall down inside itself and then... It actually it just... Out? No, it's uh, it's like you're blowing up a balloon almost. Yeah. It's a heavy plastic, but it can collapse down if you want to. But we just leave them pumped. They're about that size. Okay. But they light up just like an LED glow. And it's L-U-C-Y? L-U-C-I. They're produced by a company in New York City. L-U-C-I, Lucy Light. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's the uh, the longest we found something to run on a single charge, you know, and it automatically recharges itself. Oh yes, I have seen those. Yep. Yeah, you usually can get them at Walmart for relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, I have seen those. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty cheap too, twenty bucks. Yeah. Since there's any time to get into that. There's a lot of like circuit and stuff on there. So how are they? Is that something to be considered if you're concerned about EMPs? Would they put what you're blowing out? That'd be something we probably have to wait for an EMP to find out. Then we'll just be back here right after that. <laughs> Exactly. No, it, it doesn't. It can just be a storm. 
term, like you said, or um, whatever. Too, too many people on the power grid can shut it down, you know? And look what happened down in Texas. They were out for, what, a couple weeks, some of them. And that was just because too many people were out there because it got so cold and the grid wasn't made for all the um, portable heaters and everything. They started running, the power grid went down and then, you know, then nobody had anything. Look what happened with 9-11. Yeah. Same thing with the uh, phone towers. Mm-hmm. Too many people trying to use them. So it can be a lot of different circumstances that can um, be your need for, it might be a day, it might be a week, it might be a month.
on a special diet, you know, you're diabetic or something like that, then you need to adjust that accordingly. But for those that don't have any special diet, um, if, if the power goes out, we're more than likely going to be expending more energy than normal. For one thing, it takes more energy for your body to keep itself warm or cool. Um, you're probably going to be cooking uh, manually a lot more instead of going out to eat. <laughs> you might be going out to gather wood if you have a fireplace or a wood stove or you know if you need to um, have some scrap wood or whatever to create a little fire pit in the backyard like we talked about. You're going to be using more calories more than likely. But you need to keep your calories up. Especially to stay warm. Uh, stay active as much as possible. Increased blood flow increases your own body's ability to stay warm. These are all practical things, but it's, it, it's what works. Uh, purchase external body warmers. I'm sure you all have seen these before too, but have a supply of these in your emergency kit because if it's the middle of winter and you get cold easy, um, these you know what it's like if you have a vehicle that has a heated seat or a heated steering wheel. It makes a huge difference when you get in there in your cold. For me, I work outside. I work outside whether it's cold or hot outside, 20 below. I can still be out working. If I get into my truck and I put my seat heater on and my steering wheel heater, I'm good. You know, my hands aren't freezing anymore. They're not going to get frosted. I can go in there and warm up or whatever. It makes a big difference just to have heat applied to your body. So these things, um, especially like in a get home bag or a bug out bag, these are a necessity. If you're going to be walking, um, if he's down in the cities and we do have a PMP or, you know, and it doesn't have to be an EMP. He can be on his way home and there can be some kind of terrorist attack, let's say, on um, the major cities, let's say Minneapolis, and he needs to get home. When, if that happens, you know what's going to happen is everybody that's down in the cities is going to go north or south, but probably north. And so mm -hmm. all the major highways are going to be jam-packed and probably impassable. Eventually, there's going to be so many people trying to get out that, the, you know, well, I hate to say it, but it's going to be gridlocked. Think of, it, think of it how it is on <coughs> opening a fishing and, multi yeah. and multiply that by a hundred. Yeah. yeah, because everybody's cleaning out, See, not just the fishermen or the it, hunters. It's bad enough trying to go north when it's fishing. Right? And they're all going at the same time. Yeah. And, and they're all scared and frantic mm -hmm. because they want to get away from the city if something happens. And it's not all doom and gloom. It could be a lot of different things. But if it's 25 below outside, and now you're sitting in your vehicle in gridlock, which I don't suggest sitting in your vehicle for real long. If that happens, I suggest get out and get going and start walking because eventually, I mean, if it's 25 below, that's going to be a hard decision. You're either going to sit in your car and freeze or you're going to get out and try to start walking home. But if you've got things like this, and when we do the, the get home bag thing next week, there's a lot of things you can have in your get home bag to keep yourself warm when it's really cold outside. You don't have to freeze to death. Um, but something like this may mean the difference between losing toes and keeping your toes because you had to walk 50 miles home in cold weather. Um, they make them that fit in your for your hands, and they also make it make them big enough that they warm your the core of your body. So I do have a video. Uh, I suggest if you make a back a get home bag or a buckle bag, uh, putting a pack of these in there. And they come in all different, um, all different size packages. But that way, if you buy a big pack of them and you've got, you know, multiple people in your home, you've all got bug-up 
eggs and you've got some cookies in there. I think this is a must have actually to have in your car or in your fridge or something in the winter because even if you just get stalled, you know, um, it can make, make the difference between being really cold or coming to And you can get those battery powered too. Yeah. And my yeah. son just got one. It's a lithium battery pack, just like all the battery packs are yeah. smaller. And if it's not winter, it's a battery pack you can just charge your phone. Sure. Yep. So you can put that and you get, there, get one There's another too. battery for getting a portable. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Or warm your hands. Yep. Good idea. Electric socks. I remember we used to use them for um, skating. How many days of quiet do you have in your bag in the cities? He's probably got a five day, it depends on how much you eat. Well, it depends yeah. how hungry he wants. And if he wants to eat up all his food all at once. Yeah, yeah. He's got probably <laughs> enough in his bag for five days or six days if he. So let's just say, I don't know, you work in the cities, I forget what you do, but let's just say you're downtown Minneapolis on a project and a boom, power's out. Mm -hmm. You're walking. Mm -hmm. the vehicles are there. It's going to take you at least three or four days. To He's got enough. He doesn't get it all. Like the the That's right. You steal a bicycle. That's right. <laughs> Unless I can find some really old hot rod later. <laughs> <laughs> or my motorcycle. If you're if you're if it's winter and the power is out, 
Um, we'll get there in a minute. Um, so sleeping bags that are made for very cold temperatures sold at most sporting goods stores as well as online at Amazon and Walmart will help you stay comfortable while sleeping and may make it unnecessary for an external heat source. And that's why I suggest you know getting one that's um, the temperature range is way down there because then you probably don't have to worry about having some kind of heat source running at night. And then you got to wake up and, you know, whatever, put wood in or, you know, put a new propane tank in your buddy heater or whatever. Um, but one of these could keep you pretty warm all night. So, Lee, you're going to sleep inside a homemade tent. Let's do that. Okay. Down comforters are also very good at retaining heat. Um, so if you have down comforters, remember to use those during a power outage. Well, long guns too, but um, down, it just, it's so insulating. Uh, practical methods to keep your home warmer. We will get into that tent thing in a minute. Um, a wood stove takes no electricity to warm the home, and so it would be the number one on the priority list for when the power is up. However, a wood stove is not practical for a lot of people. The next most efficient way to keep your home warm may be the use of a whole house natural or propane gas generator, portable gas, portable gas run generator, or solar power generator converted system that can power a furnace or portable electric heat. These are probably the most costly means, but do a good job of, of providing heat. So if you can, you know, use one of those things, that's probably going to keep you the warmest, especially wood heat. If you have a wood stove, um, there's nothing like wood heat. But <coughs> So a uh, good thing to do is to close off one room to use as your warm living area. Use plastic sheets. Plastic painting drop cloths work well. In the doorways that you may that you may need to travel in and out of. So if you were to put plastic on this side, hang it down a sheet, hang down a sheet, and plastic on this side and hang down a sheet also, you've got a double layer of plastic. <coughs> and that allows less air transfer than an opening door. Using two sheets of plastic hung in front of one another then pass through one sheet at a time when entering or exiting the room. We all know what it feels like when it's 25 below outside and you go to the store with your somebody, your friend, your spouse, whoever, and you're sitting in the nice warm car scrolling through your phone. I thought you were going to say somebody else's spouse. <laughs> no, Rick. No, I wasn't. Okay. I mean, so. I wasn't. <laughs> anyway, 25 below outside, you're sitting in the vehicle, waiting at the store, waiting for whoever you're with to come out. You're nice and comfortable because the car is running and it's nice and toasty in there. And they have the nerve to come back to the car, open it up and get in and take all your warm hair up and Wrong. give you that blast. Stop doing it. That blast. I mean, <laughs> oh, it's cold air. <laughs> no, he rolls down his window at the drive up thing, just leaves it open while they're getting the food right. It's like, Shut your window. <laughs> That's why he's locking home. How do you really? Pressure heats up. Anyway, this pla these two plastic sheet things. The idea behind that is like if you have a service porch or you have um, an attached garage. That's the same type of thing because you're not pulling. You're not that. You don't have that transfer of air that air movement pulling the warmer out and the cold air in. So if you walk, you're gonna walk out of the room, you go, you open the one sheet of plastic, you go between, and then you open the second one. Then you don't have that air transfer and you're not losing that heat. Because if it's really cold outside and you're heating with a buddy heater or some other means of you know small heat, um, you wanna keep that in there. So there's, these are just ways of helping to keep your heat in. Create a tent inside your warm living area using blankets, 
sheets, tarps, etc. You can make a tent or a fort, like we did when we were kids, that will retain your own body heat. And if you have several people living in your home, make it big enough that you can all go in there. Um, you can just use like you did tables, like when you were kids, tables, chairs, whatever, to, to drape your tarp or your blankets or whatever yeah, over, so and you will stay warm. Just your body heat alone will keep you warm. Um, you can bring warm items inside to raise the temperature, such as glass or plastic jugs of hot water. So you can heat water on your camping stove or whatever, your fire pit outside, put it in jugs, pails, whatever, and bring it into your warm tent area. It'll help keep that warm. Water can be heated on a gas or charcoal grill, camping stove, fire pit, etc., and then transferred to a safe receptacle that can then be placed inside the tent. This is a great place for staying warm when sleeping, too. If you need to go outside, use a door that will allow the least amount of air transfer as possible. An attached garage or, or a porch door is a good example. Keep all your shades and curtains closed, except on some days. Open the curtains on the south side of the home or the west side during the afternoons. Promptly close the curtains when the sun is no longer high enough to heat the room. Taping plastic over windows and frames will keep out drafts. We do that. Um, we, should, we put plastic on our windows in the winter anyway, just because we like to have it kind of humid in the house. We try to keep our humidity in our house about 45%, um, which if it's cold outside, then in the morning, everything's all iced up and dewy on the inside of the windows and that aren't your windows. So we use these on all our windows in the winter anyway, but it keeps up draft, and it also makes an insulating layer in between your glass and the plastic sheet, so you don't lose as much heat during the winter time. Um, so these would work good too if you're going to have an extended power outage. Um, it, it does help you some heat and if every little thing that you do does help. It may seem insignificant, you know, all these little things, but it, it all adds up. You know, even if you can keep your, your house five degrees warmer, you know, it does make a difference. In addition to closing curtains for heat reasons, especially if it's the situation is giving you a desperate situation. You don't want people to know you have power. Right. So you have to think about that too, even if it's in the summer. You don't want people to know that you, you've got power at your place and they're desperate because they didn't prepare. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all right. Huh? I know where to go. You have power.
Plug the fan into a battery power bank. Turn on the fireplace and wait a few minutes. Once the fireplace temperature reaches a certain level, the blower fan will automatically start. Once the room is warm, monitor the external battery power bank to ensure you do not unnecessarily drain the battery. So that's one way you can heat, still using your um, gas fireplace. You just have to know where that plug is. I think it was hard to find that look for ours. It's downstairs. So no, no more. It's not anymore. All of them. Yeah, all of them. You could also run an extension cord. Anybody got the AC plug in their vehicles? A plug in their vehicle? Okay, so you could also run an extension cord to the AC plug in your vehicle if it's equipped with one. You know, remember your vehicle has power and it has a battery, and you can run things off of that as long as every once in a while you take it out of the garage and charge it up. Yeah. But don't forget about your vehicle as long as it runs. I mean, if it's an EMP or something like this, it might not run. But, um, you will need to recharge the vehicle's battery from time to time, make sure it's outside, and all of that. Okay, a Mr. Buddy Heater, or a Mr. Heater, or a Buddy Heater. For all you fish men, thank you, And I forgot to bring the canisters, but I think we brought them last week for the propane stove, so, and you guys all know what the what the little one palm canisters look like, but. Well, yeah, you can if you have the adapter, which we have an adapter for us. We have the big buddy heater too, but we didn't bring it, but um, Tom, no, Brian. Brian, where are you? Oh, there you are. Brian brought one in. There's a big one down there. That, that, put up, that puts out some really good heat, doesn't it? Yeah, that'll keep you warm. You got your bed, honey. Can't see it, is it? Um, and the big one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't see it, Lee? No. Oh. You got to go to the top. So I wanted a van out of the airport. Do your thing. Oh, okay. For a big buddy? 
Well, I think it's a small one. Yeah, if you can stop that in the grocery bag, it could be enough. Well, let's. You probably could. You just rip the bag in back and just kind of sell it and say, there you go. But either one puts on a lot of heat. They are nice eaters. Those are 120. Those are bigger. Okay, so it's about the same as Walmart. Oh, there you go. Just don't forget to get the canisters for it. And then if you uh, have a 20 gallon, you the 20 pound cylinder, you got to have the filter with a longer hole. Yeah, there's an adapter you can get so you can actually use the 20 pound can. There's no adapter. We also make an adapter to fill in the one pound can. Yep, yep, we do that too. So once you get my adapter, but they do recommend using a filter. Certain hoses, even if they're pump body, uh, when you're using the propane the oil, the holes will get in and fun. So that's why it's just to use a external filter. Yeah. Have you ever seen those sun No. But good heaters. And when heat can wait, you're behind it yourself. It's got close. So make sure that you have the necessary propane tanks filled filled to keep them running. We have several. I don't know how many you have, but we have several. And then we can fill with our propane tank too because he's got the, the yeah, thing yeah. that we after to fill it. So we can keep ours filled if we need to. That's a good thing to have if you're creating that tent or small room in your home to stay warm. Um, oh, always, always, always have a working smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector. and fire extinguisher when using these items. If you use a portable heater such as a Mr. Heater to stay warm when sleeping, then take shifts if there's more than one of you in the home. So someone is always awake and keeps an eye on the heater. The one awake could be doing chores or other activity to be sure to stay alert. There are also... You can also get the little uh, like wood stove fan and sit down here and yeah. on the heat. Yeah. These are just the little canisters that I was talking about. I'm sure you've all seen them before. This is what you would buy for the bunny eaters <coughs> for one pound. And this is Cabela's that has a four pack for $23. Oh, and that's the price or not. Choke everything on the Except for our 
Are you done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so he's just my name. 